My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our feast day today, otherwise known as the Feast of Christ the King, Sunday before Advent commences, is actually a very curious feast. It's a relatively new one. It first came about in December of 1925 and was first celebrated by Roman Catholics in 1926. Now, this isn't necessarily trivia for you this Sunday, but the year is important. And before I say more, I just want to reflect on that year. If you know your history, the 1920s were a particularly tumultuous time in the world and in the church. On the one hand, many in Western Europe and North America were experiencing economic prosperity unlike any previous age. Although the Great War still casted its shadow upon the peoples of the time, new hope swelled among peoples. The League of Nations first met in 1925 with a desire for peace and to avoid any global conflict. Germany was in the middle of its first Republican experience, later known as the Weimar Republic, an age of social liberalism, not only within Berlin, but in other parts of the former empire. And Canada celebrated the opening of Canada House in London, which according to King George at the time, was a reflection of Canada as a great nation. Many, at least, among the more wealthy nations, were optimistic for better years ahead. Still, there were worrying and troubling indicators all was not well in the world. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 gave birth to the Soviet Union, which by 1925 was seeking to gain its maximum growth and extent. Communism was spreading fast and far across the world, with the Communist Party even forming a group in India in 1925. And all was not terribly well in Germany either. Adolf Hitler, head of the newly formed Nazi Party, was gaining strength and popularity he would release in that year his opus magnus, Mein Kampf. And if you think all was quiet here in North America, the Ku Klux Klan held its first gathering in that year. Religiously, secularism was spreading fast across Europe and North America. So much so, now get this, this is a point that I find so amusing. So much so that the Anglican Bishop of Toronto at the time, James Sweeney, expected the Anglican Church of Canada to be closed within 10 years. Sounds like a familiar line. <laughs> Perhaps fearing the same, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Methodists joined forces in 1925 and formed what is now known as the United Church of Canada, with a membership of just 600,000 people. And Roman Catholics weren't much far behind with the great churches and cathedrals across Europe either growing empty or abandoned as a result of secularism and political turmoil. A year later, the Cristero War would see Catholics persecuted across Mexico, with countless priests, religious, and lay people slaughtered for the faith. Well, we may think of ourselves as the first to see the church collapse, which, by the way, this is not the first age. Christianity is actually seeing its falling apart many times in history. And we may think of ourselves as the first time to experience horrendous political movements such as Trump and Putin, and the first to endure another wave of racial, ethnic, and sexual discrimination. 
We are only repeating the past. And almost, it's quite eerie, almost exactly as they did in 1925. When it comes to history, we humans are not terribly creative or unique. We're not. We're just repeating the same thing over and over. We simply don't learn from the past. So why am I saying all this? Deeply concerned by what he saw growing across the horizon in the world and in the church of the day, the Bishop of Rome, Pope Pius XI, issued a letter in December of 1925 entitled Quas Primus, in which he wrote, Manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of people had, tr had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy laws out of their lives, that these had no place either in private affairs or politics, and we said further that as long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no real hope or prospect of lasting peace among the nations. In order to reestablish the centrality of Christ and the reign of God's love, with the creation of a new feast day entitled Christ the King, I wonder if Pius failed to understand he and the church of his time were very much a part of the same problem of which he decried. Still lamenting the loss of the papal states in Italy, there were many in the church at that time, both Catholic and Anglican, this was not uniquely a Catholic experience, Anglicans did as well in England, were desperate to restore days of former glory and the church's dominance in society. Thus, I find myself not too terribly keen about the feast day of Christ the King. However, unfortunately for me, <laughs> Anglicans, <laughs> and I'm a little critical today on a certain point, <laughs> but you'll see why. Anglicans and their quick adaptation of, Catholic lit of the Catholic liturgical movement in the 1970s and 80s dropped in many places the Book of Common Prayer and almost entirely embraced the Roman Catholic prayer book. What you and I actually celebrate is basically the Roman Catholic Mass with a couple tiny Anglican insertions, such as the prayer of humble access and also the confession beforehand. As such, this curious feast found its way into the Anglican Church. Ironically, at a time when so many in the church were critical of colonialism and questioning of monarchy. Instead, I personally prefer much more the Book of Common Prayer's observation of the Sunday before Lent, also known as Stir Up Sunday, because of the collect which begins, Stir up, we beseech you, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people. Anybody know what food you make on this day? Fruitcake. Repeat it. Fruit cake. Fruit, well, fruit. fruit You're so, <laughs> that was not the answer I was looking for, but that works. <laughs> Christmas cake. No, Francis. Christmas pudding. Oh. Christmas pudding. You made your Christmas pudding on this day. So it was called stir up Sunday because you would stir up all the fats on this day. It was quite a wonderful thing. By the way, there will be a test after the sermon. So hopefully you remember all these details. I'm getting to a point here. <laughs> so why am I so critical and questioning of this day? Precisely because Jesus never declared himself king, as we heard in the gospel. And because it entirely misses the point and purpose of our ministry, Christ came not to establish a new kingdom like our own, nor to enter into our political forums. Remember, it was Jesus who said, Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God's. No, this is a key point. He came to love 
and serve the most vulnerable among us, the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, the marginalized, and the disenfranchised. His way is a way of love and humility, not of royal power and might. And it is he who calls us to do the same, as we hear every year on Holy Thursday, love one another as I have loved you. However, if we start introducing kingship into this, we're going to get it all terribly wrong. Much as the people did in the prophet Samuel's time when they begged God to give them a king. We see the fruit of this with Christian nationalism, not only in the United States, but in many other countries, including Russia. Calling Christ as king has become a tool for extremist Christians in the United States and Canada to impose upon people their moralistic and political agendas. Where is the way of love when we hear of Christian leaders ostracizing trans and queer persons? Where is the love when Christians ignore the housing crisis and growing despair between the haves and have-nots? And where are we when God's way of love is needed most? As we enter into the last week of the church's year and begin another year next Sunday, I invite us to ask ourselves, as a Christian community gathered in this place, how are we living Jesus' way of love? And I don't mean just being nice. It goes much deeper than being nice or being good. It begins here and radiates beyond here. Do we still find ourselves imagining and dreaming of former glory years? Or are we looking forward in faith to being instruments of God's grace and peace, love in our faith community, our families, and our city? I pray we seek the latter to offer a radical welcome to all in this space, particularly those ignored, lost, or forgotten. I pray we relinquish ourselves of all pride and embrace each other with love and compassion and raise each other up. Most of all, I pray we become a symbol of the inbreaking of God's love in this world not according to our ways, but according to God's way. Amen.